Happy Sabbath. You know, what a privilege it is to be back at church. I can see Warren smiling behind that mask. So I know that for those that are here, that you'll experience a blessing. And also for those that are joining us online, that God is here to meet our need. Be strong and of good courage. And finally, number three, trust in the Lord. God is promising. Thank you for that beautiful special item. And also thank you for the song service this morning. It was really, all of the, the songs and the hymns that were, were sung had such special messages. And indeed, God has the grace and the mercy our hearts are longing for. Thank you. It is a blessing to worship with Silverleaf Church today. And it is a privilege to share with you. Shall we just bow our heads for another word of prayer? Dear Lord, I thank you that we can ask your Holy Spirit to guide us and to teach us from your word. Lord, I pray that you would bless this message in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to imagine the scene with me. And I'll, I'll be sharing a piece written by Bradley Booth from a book, Every Day with Jesus. And he writes... She knelt there in the dust of the stony street, terrified, guilty, embarrassed. She had known that such a day must come sooner or later. She had hoped for later. But now her shame was exposed, her guilt sure. The authorities caught her in the act of selling her body. She kept her head down the only safe thing left to do. Her shoulders shook with tremors of the coming judgment, her tears frantic but unnoticed by the growing mob. Around her in the streets screamed the howling rabble, their sneers demonic, their fingers already clutching stones. Execution by stoning was her verdict. From beneath her swollen, painted eyelids, she glimpsed a stranger squatting in the street. Her accusers were hovering over him, hammering him with the shameful details of her capture. Her eyes flitted from one accuser in the group to the next, and then fell again as these men turned from time, turned from time to time to point in her direction. The stranger seemed detached, almost uninterested in their excited ramblings, and instead bent himself to toy with the dust at his feet. The temple delegation seemed intent on getting him to join them in conversation, but he remained ambivalent as he traced something with his finger in the street for them to see, and many crowded close around him to catch a glimpse of it for themselves. If any one of you is without sin, the stranger, stranger's voice echoed on the street, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then went back to his curious writing. Slowly there came an unexplainable shift in the crowd as the multitude grew quiet. She noticed the silence imperceptible at first, then more pronounced. The crowd melted away, first the authorities and then those standing closest to her. The thud of stones hitting pavement echoed in the street and finally to her amazement and grateful relief, the street stood empty and silent. She glanced around her to be sure that it was so. But when the stranger straightened up and asked, Woman, where are they? Has no one 
condemned you? She knew it was true. There was a long pause. Her head down, she found, finally whispered in relief and surprise, there is no one, sir. Still the silence pressed upon her. She glanced one more through the strands, through strands of uncombed hair, and then it was she saw his eyes upon her, compassionate and loving, with no hint of blame. Never had she seen such eyes. Never had she felt such a warmth of kindness and acceptance. Neither do I condemn you, the stranger declared, in tones that touched her deepest heartstrings. Go and sin no more. So this woman's heart, I believe, was melted by the love of Jesus. I believe she experienced repentance and went and obeyed Jesus' command, go and sin no more. That this became a promise to her that was fulfilled in her life. She experienced true repentance, I believe. And that's what I would like to talk to you about, heartfelt repentance, experiencing heartfelt repentance. John 8 verse 11, the words of Jesus to her, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. I would like to start off by looking at what repentance is not, before we look at what true repentance is all about. So what repentance is not? Repentance is not about being sad or expressing sorrow or mourning or grief over the suffering or the consequences that result from sin. That's not true repentance in the Bible sense. Simply being sad about the suffering or the consequences that result from sin might lead to a temporary turning away from sin. But in order to escape further judgment, but it does not change you on a heart level. You don't turn away from sin on the heart level when this type of repentance or so-called repentance is experienced. Simply being sad about the suffering or the consequences that result from sin does not produce a change of purpose in your mind. It does not produce a hatred of sin, and it therefore does not lead to life change. I hope we're together so far. So one of the problems of simply being sad about the consequences or the suffering from the results of sin is a person may well continue in the wrongdoing if the consequences were to stop. For example, we find Pharaoh is a good example here in the book of Exodus. We find the judgments of God were coming upon Egypt and he would repent, so-called repent, and say, okay, I will, I will stop. You can go. You can leave with, with God's people. But as soon as Moses prayed and those judgments were lifted, what did he do? He continued defying God, and he continued in rebellion against God. So when the consequences were removed, he continued in his wrongdoing. And that's evidence of not true repentance that God would have us experience. Esau, Balaam, and Judas Iscariot are other Bible um, characters that one can look into for the same experience. They, they were sorry about the consequences or the suffering that resulted from their sin, but they didn't change on a heart level as God would desire us to change. So the question then is, what is genuine repentance? If that is not genuine repentance, what is genuine repentance. So let's look at that. And I appreciate this quotation from the book Steps to Christ, which summarizes or defines repentance so beautifully. Repentance includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. Two aspects, a sorrow for sin, truly being sorry for sin, and turning away from it. And I would like us to explore this some more. So let's look at sorrow for sin. What is it? What is sorrow for sin? Now David's prayer in Psalm 51 illustrates or provides a good biblical example of true sorrow for sin. And I would like to read it to you. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me. I'll read a 
think there's 19 verses in the chapter. I'll read 17, the first 17 of them. Psalm 51, verse 1 to 17. And I'll be reading in the New King James Version. I'll just give you a few moments to get there. So this is David's prayer after his sin with Bathsheba. And after Nathan the prophet spoke to him and appealed to him. This is David's prayer. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom." Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. As I read, do you also have the same desire as David had, to also be washed and to be found whiter than snow? Verse 8, make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Psalm 51 verse 1 to 17. So I believe from David's experience you can see that true sorrow for sin is sincere and from the heart. It offers no excuses and does not try to appear, make yourself appear better than you are. It has no desire and makes no plea to escape the threatened judgment. It sees the enormity or the sinfulness of sin. It sees the defilement that sin causes. It prays both for pardon, yes, but also for purity of heart. Where David prayed, create in me a clean heart, O God. Yes, forgive me, blot out my sins, but create in me a clean heart, O God. It longs for the joy of holiness. It longs to be restored to harmony and fellowship with God. So what will such true sorrow for sin lead to? If we have true sorrow for sin, what will that lead to? It will lead to our second part of our definition of repentance, to turning away from sin. True sorrow for sin, I believe, will lead to turning away from it. So let's look at that aspect, turning away from sin. Now, true sorrow for sin, in other words, will lead to a change of purpose, a hatred for sin, and therefore it will lead to true life change. And that's what God wants to give us by His grace. Here's a beautiful quotation from Steps to Christ, an insightful quotation, which says, We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. And just a note on that, we'll only see the sinfulness of sin when we see Jesus dying on the cross, only then will we realize 
how evil sin is and how great sin is because it caused the death of the Son of God to atone for our sin. But the second half is the one I want to focus on now. Until we turn away from it in heart, until we turn away from sin in heart, there will be no real change in the life. Now, this is something that we cannot do for ourselves. So how can we turn away from sin in heart? So let's look at, and I pray that this will make sense, how can we experience genuine heartfelt repentance as a, as a result of God's work in our lives? The first thing we need to know is that we cannot produce this true heartfelt repentance on our own. It's beyond us. We are incapable of producing this in and of ourselves. So let's not try to do this apart from God. If that's the only lesson you take from this sermon, that would be enough. Don't try to produce this in and of yourself. It is God who wants to work it in you. The good news is that true repentance is a gift from Jesus. I, I love this verse. Acts 5 verse 31. Now it's referring to Jesus. And it says, Him, that is Jesus, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. And notice these two things. To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. That for me is very good news. Not only forgiveness. Repentance is not something we have to do apart from God and then he will forgive us. But here this verse says that both of them are a gift from Jesus. Repentance and forgiveness of sins. Does that make sense? Both of them. So we need to go to Jesus for the gift of repentance. So genuine repentance is something Jesus produces in our lives through the working of the Holy Spirit as we come to him and seek this gift of repentance. Importantly, Jesus invites us to come just as we are. Come to him as we are. Matthew 11 verse 28 is that beautiful invitation which Jesus, where he invites, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come with your heavy burden of guilt and sin, which is the heaviest burden that we bear. And it will crush us if we don't come to Jesus. But Jesus invites us, Come to me with that, just as you are, and I will will give you rest. What a beautiful invitation to come to Jesus. So come just as you are. Don't wait to make yourself better. I think this is a trap that Satan wants us to fall into, is where he, he wants us to feel that we need to clean up our act before coming to Jesus. We'll touch on that just now, but don't wait to make yourself better. Don't think you need to repent or clean up your act before coming to Jesus. The fact is that we cannot repent. We cannot change. We cannot clean up our act without coming to Jesus. So he's the source of our help, the source of our repentance through the Holy Spirit. So if we are to repent on ourselves, by ourselves, apart from Christ, we are attempting an impossibility. We need to go to him and he will give us the gift of repentance. So just as we cannot be forgiven without Jesus' blood that was shed for our sin, so too we cannot repent without Jesus producing it in us through the Holy Spirit. Something I've realized as I seek to learn more about the gospel is that from start to finish, it is all a work of God's grace. There is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves, but God wants to do it for us, in us and through us, and here too with repentance. It is only as we heed the invitation of Jesus to come unto him with our burden of guilt and sin that he is able to give us true repentance. Here's a quotation from Steps to Christ again from the chapter Repentance, and it says, Christ is the source of every right impulse. He is the only one that can implant in the heart enmity against sin. We can't do it, but he can do it. Every good thing that we desire, 
is from him. Every desire for truth and purity, every conviction of our own sinfulness is an evidence that his spirit is moving upon our hearts. So even before someone even realizes that God is drawing them, if they have a desire for truth and purity, if they realize their own sinfulness, the Holy Spirit is already at work, even if they don't yet recognize that God is the one doing the work. So don't try to produce repentance apart from Christ. Go to him and allow him to work it in you through the working of the Holy Spirit. So I want us to briefly look at the role of the Holy Spirit in repentance. And I hope that this would make sense. So how does Jesus produce repentance in us through the Holy Spirit? Maybe in summary, we could say the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us. Listen to John 15 verse 26. Jesus says, But when the Helper comes whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. He will testify of Jesus. He will glorify Christ. He will uplift Jesus to our minds. So as you consider the life and death of Christ, as you study the Bible, as you read and learn about Jesus, his life and in his death, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you the beautiful character of Jesus, which is the character of God. Jesus was God in human flesh. The Holy Spirit will also reveal, in contrast to the loveliness of Jesus, review, reveal your own sinfulness by contrast. And then the Holy Spirit won't leave you there in despair. The Holy Spirit will then reveal Christ to you as the Savior, dying for your sins and for my sins. So let's look at each of these briefly, starting with Jesus revealing the character of Jesus. So as you study the Bible, the Holy Spirit would uplift Jesus and help you to understand the true character of God as manifested in the life and death of Jesus. You will come to realize the love and the goodness of God, something that is so fundamental to a healthy experience with God. As you study the life of Jesus, the Holy Spirit would bring this conviction to your mind. In the Savior's life, the principles of God's law, love to God and man, were perfectly exemplified. You will see his life as a demonstration or a, you know, a demonstration of the principle of love to his Father and to others. Benevolence and selfish love was the life of of his soul. You'll see that compassion, mercy, and love were revealed in every act of Jesus' life. So you will see and behold the character of God as you study the life of Jesus. And then, in contrast, the Holy Spirit would reveal our own sinfulness. As we behold the matchless love of Christ, it is then that we will see our own sinfulness and our own hearts. In contrast to his lovely character, we will see how just unlovely we are. In contrast to his unselfish character, we will see just how selfish we are. Just as a side note, if you read, I think it's Luke chapter 18, when the Pharisee and the publican went to pray, the Pharisee was recounting all the good things that he was doing. And the Pharisee, the publican, or the tax collector, all he prayed, he stood afar off, he didn't even look up to heaven, he just said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Pharisee was not looking to Jesus. The Pharisee was looking to others, and he thought, well, I'm pretty good then. But the publican, the tax collector, looking realizing who Jesus was, realizing who God, what God's character was like, realized the sinfulness of his own life. So we need to compare ourselves with Jesus. And as the Holy Spirit brings the character of Jesus before our minds, we will realize who we are. I hope that makes sense. So the Holy Spirit searches our hearts and reveals to us our own characters. 
we see our sin and our selfishness in, in their true light, and the Holy Spirit brings conviction to our minds and hearts. Listen to this quotation again from that chapter in Steps to Christ. One ray of the glory of God, one gleam of the purity of Christ penetrating the soul makes every spot of defilement painfully distinct and lays bare the deformity and the defects of the human character. It makes apparent the unhallowed desires, the infidelity of the heart, the impurity of the lips. The sinner's acts of disloyalty in making void the law of God are exposed to his sight, and his spirit is stricken and afflicted under the searching influence of the Spirit of God. He loathes himself as he views the pure, spotless character of God. I'm so glad the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us there. That's part of repentance that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in us, but he doesn't leave us there. We realize that our own righteousness cannot save us. When we see ourselves for who we truly are, we realize that we need the righteousness of Jesus, that our own righteousness is as filthy rags. We realize our need of a savior. When we see ourselves, we realize that we cannot save ourselves. And then the Holy Spirit reveals to us Jesus as our savior dying for our sins. Having no hope in ourselves, we see the all-sufficient Savior, Jesus. As Jesus said in John 12, 32, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. The Holy Spirit presents Christ uplifted as our Savior. And as the Holy Spirit reveals this to us, we realize that the blood of Christ alone can cleanse us from the defilement of sin and renew our hearts in his own likeness. We realize that Jesus is our only hope and savior. The soul thus touched will hate its selfishness, abhor its self-love, and will seek through Christ's righteousness, not our own, for the purity of heart that is in harmony with the law of God and the character of Christ. So the Holy Spirit leads us to accept Jesus as our personal Savior and to receive his righteousness. As the Holy Spirit reveals Christ as your Savior, the one dying for your sins, the Holy Spirit will lead you to realize just how sacred and unchangeable God's law of love must really be because it necessitated such a great sacrifice in order to atone for your sin. If there was an easier way, I'm sure God would have chosen the easier way. But because there was no other way, but that Jesus needed to die for our sins, that was the only way. And we realize the unchangeable nature of God's law. As you are made to realize that it was also for your sin and my sin that Christ had to die, as you behold how much God must love you and love me in paying the penalty of your sin. Romans 2 verse 4 would be realized, which is, I'll get to that now. But as we behold the love of God for us personally in Jesus dying for us, this will melt our hearts. It will impress our minds and it will inspire true repentance in our lives. We need to realize the love of God for us in dying for our sins to produce this repentance in us. And then we will agree with the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, 2 verse 4, where he says, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness of God, the love of God leads you to repentance. The sinner may resist this love may refuse to be drawn to Christ, but if he does not resist, he will be drawn to Jesus. A knowledge of the plan of salvation will lead him to the foot of the cross in repentance for his sins, which have caused the sufferings of God's dear Son. 
So in closing, if we do not resist the work of God in our lives, if we do not resist the love of Christ and refuse to be drawn to Christ, if we don't resist what God wants to do, genuine, heartfelt sorrow for sin and a sincere resolve to live in loving obedience to God and his law will be produced in us by the Holy Spirit as a gift of God's grace. It is thus that Jesus brings about true repentance through the work of the Holy Spirit. True, genuine, heartfelt repentance. Something that we cannot produce in and of ourselves. This genuine repentance will produce a change of purpose in our mind. It will produce a hatred for sin. And ultimately, it will lead to true life change. So, based on this message, my invitation, I have seven different points that I would like to encourage you with in my invitation. I invite you to come to Jesus just as you are. With all your sin and guilt, come now, come to Jesus. I invite you to ask God to reveal himself to you and his love to you. I invite you to look to Jesus to study his perfect life and to meditate on the infinite sacrifice he made on the cross as your Savior and my Savior. I invite you to realize that it was for your sin that he willingly offered up his life for my sin. I invite you to accept the precious gift of Christ's blood, which alone can cleanse us from the defilement of sin and renew our hearts in his likeness. I invite you to allow the goodness and the love of God, as demonstrated in the life and death of Jesus, to melt your heart into loving submission to his will. I invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life so that you may experience genuine Holy Spirit-inspired, heartfelt repentance. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for the wonderful work that you want to do in our lives by your grace. Lord, I thank you that we don't need to come up with true sorrow for sin and turning away from it by ourselves. Lord, I thank you that this is what you want to produce in us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would do a special work in our lives. Lord, I pray that we would see Jesus clearly as the Savior dying for our sins personally. Lord, I pray that you would give us an experience, give us this experience of genuine, heartfelt repentance by your grace. Lord, I pray that you would give us or provide us this something that we cannot do for ourselves. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. And we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.